Britney Sting is a quaint little nation of archaic monarchy, etiquette, bowler hats, and tea and crumpets on the lawn. Of course, spend any time whatsoever over here, and those notions are quickly dashed. The UK isn't exactly a crime riddled hellhole or a failing state, but nor is it a rolling hills of green pastures and unlocked back doors. Crime, especially organised crime, thrives here, just as it does everywhere else in the world. There are some serious criminal enterprises in this country. Crime gangs in Britain are mostly quiet and go about their illicit business, making money and keeping their heads down. Occasionally, though, they will make a noise. Crime can be a messy business. Toes get stepped on and fingers get broken. Intergang feuds can happen and mediation isn't the first port of call. Here are some of the most memorable and noteworthy examples of when British gangs declared war on each other. It makes sense to kick things off with British criminal history's most notorious feud, the East London versus South London Turf War of the 1960s between two sets of infamous brothers. Ask someone to conjure up an image of old school British firms and they'll no doubt picture the Cray Twins, infinitely higher profile than their peers south of the river, Ronnie and Reggie have legendary status in British law. The reality was, however, Eddie and Charlie Richardson of the Richardson Gang were more violent, more feared, bigger earners and more impressive criminals. Charlie Richardson and his torture gang resented the way the craze swanned about London like film stars while him and his crew were seen as thugs. The animosity and tit-for-tat violence between the two outfits permeated London in the mid-60s. Things came to a head when Ronnie shot and killed Richardson's affiliated hood George Cornell in 1966. But before the war could fully erupt, the Met Police temporarily shut down the Richardsons with a spate of arrests that called the beef between the two families. In the 1990s and early 2000s, two street gangs ruled Birmingham. They ran drugs and guns, committed robberies and kidnappings, and even carried out murders. The Johnson crew, or Johnnies, and the Berg Bar crew, or Burgers, poisoned the second city with a blatant and terrifying disregard for life. Many of the killings stemmed from their intense rivalry. Both gangs started rather oddly, innocently enough. In fact, you could argue that the formations were positive. Both factions grew as support networks ways for young black and Asian teenagers in Birmingham to be able to move freely without fear of attacks from far-right groups, which were a big problem in the city at the time. Soon though, criminality and violence crept in. Both gangs began selling drugs in Birmingham and quickly encroached on each other's turf. Beatings were exchanged, kidnappings and stabbings followed, then shootings. Things escalated as more and more extreme tactics were employed. Soon the war would become national news. The postcode rivalry came to a head in 2003 when two teenage girls, Latia Shakespeare and Charlene Ellis, were shot dead in the crossfire between two gangs at a New Year's Eve party. Some of the fiercest gang warfare on the streets of Britain comes from organised crime groups with foreign ties. For some years now, Turkish gangs have controlled vast swathes of drugs that move around London. There's no national allegiance, however it's every group for themselves. Not only do Turkish organised crime groups have to evade the police and compete for locals and other foreign gangs over the capital's dope trade, they often fight each other. It's fairly safe to say that the North London Tottenham boys and the East London Hackney Bombers don't get on. Over the last 12 years, dozens of serious assaults and up to 10 murders have been connected to the feud. So you'd imagine the initial cause was something quite shocking, right? Well, wrong. It started when senior member of the Hackney Bombers was slapped across the face in a snooker club controlled by the Tottenham mob. It 
Between the walls, Sheffield was a tough place to live. A dark and thick black soot stained city, one George Orwell called the ugliest in the world. Poverty was rife, unemployment was the norm. Overcrowding and rife alcoholism and gambling didn't help. From such environments, crime usually sprouts. We're not talking the odd sixpence on a horse here. We're talking about the illegal gang run setups in the 1920s Sheffield. The game was ring toss, effectively head or tails. Miners would often spend their wages betting on the game in the city centre, which was controlled by George Mooney's Mooney Gang. Worsening unemployment saw takings down and Mooney's bottom line hit, so he let go of his workforce. Those hoods soon started up their own gang, the Park Brigade, and started trying to muscle in on what was left of Mooney's business. It turned ugly, very ugly. Soon the violence consumed both gangs and neither were making much money. It all became about the vengeance and attacks. Things came to a head when a man unaffiliated to either gang got caught up. When William Plummer was beaten to death on the street where he lived, the community and the police took a stand and soon both gangs were driven out and taken down. The idea of a violent gang and warfare and lollies and ice creams might sound daft, but the Glasgow ice cream wars were anything but. The idea of serious criminals selling drugs and stolen goods from a rainbow coloured transit van that placed tinny versions of green sleeves and the William Tell Overture theme out of a roof mounted speaker is pretty strange. The idea that lots of them would be downright bizarre were welcome to Glasgow in the 1980s. The sales of 99s, fabs and zooms were a course of front. What started as a licit and frankly ingenious way to hawk narcotics in broad daylight soon became something of a shame for the city. Soon everyone knew about the ruse and the pressure grew on the police to act. The police were slow to take on the criminals and the police were referred to as the serious chime squad by Glaswegians at the time. Turf soon became an issue among gangs running vans and soon the main gang involved, the Marchettis, felt their patches were being encroached on. Violence ensued, culminating in a frightener being ordered. But instead of one young lad's house being attacked with fire as a warning, a full-scale blaze erupted and Andrew Doyle and his entire family, including his 18-month-old son, died. The deaths caused a public outrage and the Strathclyde police were put under intense pressure to bring those responsible to justice. Over the following months, Strathclyde police arrested several suspects, eventually charging six with the murder of the Doyle family. Four of the men were sentenced, but there was a challenge to their conviction. With two of those sentenced launching a legal battle that lasted 20 years. The three police reports from arresting officers all cited an identical 24 word phrase as a damning confession in their reports. A highly unlikely outcome, given that the officers were recalling the words from memory. 